Um, I work as an independent consultant. Um, I call myself a circular economy practitioner because that's what I, I think about 100% of my, my working hours. Uh, I have a history uh, working full-time for the Ella MacArthur Foundation until about 18 months ago where I moved from the Isle of Wight to Stockholm um, s and started my, I guess, freelance life. I still work uh, about half of my time uh, as a contractor to the foundation, so that's something to disclose. Um, and for that reason, a lot of the things I will talk about from a circular economy point of view will be uh, quite similar and build on uh, de or derive from, from the Ella MacArthur Foundation work. So, just to kind of establish what we're talking about, um, in case anybody here hasn't heard about circular economy, what is it? Well, the first thing to note maybe if you look at this sort of flow diagram is that it isn't simple. Um, the, the traditional economy as we, as we describe it, even though it's extremely complex and granular, is quite easy to illustrate as a linear flow, right? We begin by extracting resources, we refine these resources in several steps by adding energy, capital, labor, and out comes a product. This product is used over a lifetime and then it's normally discarded. If you will, this is kind of the vertical line in this diagram. Um, a circular economy kind of takes a step back and looks at the idea of material flows and say, how can we do this in a you know, in a way that's actually restorative and regenerative by design. After all, we know we have only finite amount of most of the critical resources to our economy. Uh, uh, arguments vary on how much we have left. Have we reached peak oil? Have we not? How much? How longer can the, the current fossil feedstocks uh, sustain us? That's not really the point. The point is they will eventually deplete. And if we want to have a civilization that goes on not for another 100 years, but maybe for another 1,000 years or longer, this is an important question to start addressing. There are, of course, also the renewable resources, which are illustrated on the left side of, of this diagram, uh, or the biological part of the cycle, um, which is interesting because they need to take over a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the roles currently played by finite resources. But that also comes with, with its challenges in, for example, land use, ecosystem stability and all the other services that ecosystems provide. And a circular economy uh, seeks to dis dis design a framework which is, you know, on the biological side, regenerative by design. I mean, we, we, cannot, we cannot provide food for, um, for billions of more people if we actually deplete the, um, the, the basic production factors that we, that we use for this food. Um, and we cannot expect a healthier, uh, more productive food system if we at the same time uh, deplete what the water we use or make, um, make this land or this, these waters toxic to us. So these are some kind of pretty basic um, uh, boundary conditions for a circular economy. And then there is this question about designing out waste or preventing waste by design. Um, one of the most common criticisms towards circular economy oh, is to be saying, oh, that's not really possible. There will always be leakage and so on. That's true, um, but that's not really the point of this diagram. This point of this diagram is to say there are so many ways in which you can design in naturally occurring cycles of products and materials um, and resources, and it's not just about recycling. And how do you do that? Well, it's not about creating the best in class waste management system because that, that there you're beginning in the wrong end. It is about designing for circularity. And that's true whether it's a car, it's a mining machine, or it's a piece of packaging. And just to remind ourselves of why we need this, um, I don't think this is too necessary to go into detail uh, in this room, but, but we basically have to find another way of dealing with resources if we want to remain productive and economically viable going forward. Um, we can see this on, on the amount of waste we create or the amount of value we lose, if you will, in the current linear economy. Uh, we can see it on how much we have left in terms of productive topsoil in the world. We can, we can talk about it in terms of um, planetary boundaries. Uh, and there's actually some, some optimistic news here. Circular economy has been uh, estimated to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, pr and um, 
primary resource consumption in the EU significantly, only by really pulling in a quite conservative way uh, on a number of levers for some of the main uh, uh, areas of consumption, namely mobility, built environment, and food. But also we do want to sustain our economy. And it's important to remember that circular economy is not about kind of going back to uh, going back to the good old days before the industrial revolution. Nobody really wants that. We, d we do want to remain economically viable, productive. So circular economy tries to really decouple economic value creation and productivity from uh, consumption of finite resources. And there are a couple of different studies that have shown that this can actually increase or boost uh, national GDP. And I would say that uh, this kind of alludes to, to uh, the, the previous talks as well, that you know, if, we, if we try to do things in an incremental way in the current linear system, we'll only really be able to do less bad. Because we're not changing the system we're in. And as we increase our efforts, we might, wanna, we, we might be able to go a little bit a little bit higher up on this scale, but if the, the, the fundamental framework we're using is not really regenerative or adding uh, benefit to the system in itself, we're, we're not going to we're not we're not going to change the uh, we're not going to change the situation. So uh, the circular economy provides at least the option to make efforts that do more good instead of just less bad. And as many others today, I will continue to talk about this in the context of plastics. Um, we do live, um, many <laughs> argue, in, a, in the plastic century. This has gotten many different names, the plastic era, the plasticine. Um, it's quite interesting to just take a step back and remember that this, uh, group, of chem this group of substances or synthetically, uh, synthetically manufactured polymers were only invented about 110 years ago. And since then, as we know, a lot has happened. Um, and this is kind of how it, how it developed. Exponential increase in plastic production and use uh, with a lot of benefits, obviously, uh, for most of the 20th century. And it was really only in the beginning of the, um, of the current decade that research started to raise questions about the sustainability of this system. Um, and the, the, the big... Um, uh, the big explosion of activity really happened about three, four years ago with a number of seminal uh, scientific papers and reports published. Um, and the, the work I've been mostly involved in, the New Plastics Economy, it launched three and a half years ago. And it's quite remarkable to see uh, how, how enormously this conversation has changed just since, uh, just since that, uh, that point in time three and a half years ago. So that means a couple of things. It means that people are getting it. They, it, it means that we, uh, that most people I agree that what we need is a circular economy framework for plastics to make this work. Um, there's, there's a couple of other ways to illustrate this, of course. This is a Sankey-type diagram of the current plastic material flows. This was produced in 2015, um, but the, the general numbers have not really changed. We believe, if anything, this number has probably decreased a bit since, um, since this was published. And it's not, again, it's not about the plastics. The, pla the plastics as a material is not in fault here. The problem is the system we use to produce, use, and then discard plastics. And because of the lack of a system that works, we end up with extreme adva uh, extremely adverse consequences, both economically and environmentally. The actual environmental impacts, all the plastic leakage uh, directly to environment or leach it from landfill are kind of poorly understood. You guys in the room probably understand this better than most people in the world, but it's still a little bit of a anyone's guess. But it is also a huge economic loss. The, the total value of the value of, of the material that just flows through the system once and then is lost to the economy is between 80 and 120 billion dollars. And by just recycling, we will not solve this. We will, that's like putting a plaster on a, um, uh, on a cyst for cancer. We need something 
we need something better, we need something something systemic. And picking up on on what was also said before that we have we are looking at an extremely or uh, continuous exponential growth of plastic production uh, in the world. Two hundred billion dollars of investment into more oil and gas, more virgin polymer production, reports by um, by analytics institutes talking about how the petrochemical industry look to plastic to see as, as the main growth driver instead of oil, uh, given that the, the world seems to be moving away from fossil fuels. What does that really mean? Um, the word plastic bubble was mentioned earlier today, uh, and it's, it's actually quite an, uh, uh, quite an adept term uh, if you compare it to what people talk about when they talk about carbon bubbles. If you look at if you look at these uh, these investments and the projected increase in output, which is by the way very much priced into the company uh, in to the company valuations that produce the materials, it looks like the market is betting on this continuing to increase exponentially. That can mean either that uh, these these companies are extremely overvalued, in other words, a bubble. Or it means that we, we're really nowhere near bending the curve of plastic waste. Wait a minute, you say, oh, shouldn't we just recycle all the plastics that we produce and refine? Well, if we do recycle all these plastics, do we really need to produce all that virgin plastics? Um, and, is and, by, and, and the other question is, is, is the cost of building all that infrastructure by, uh, to take care of the extra plastic we produce is that viable when we cannot barely take care of, you know, a mere fraction of what we produce today? Um, I will say that there is uh, a lot of work being conducted at the moment that looks at exactly this question. And I cannot talk more about it than say that it will be published in the beginning of next year. But you don't need to invest massive resources to into, into looking at the numbers to understand this. Uh, this is a Swedish example, just kind of testing what if we increase the recycling rate massively by, by 2040. Um, what does it really do to the volumes? So here's how much plastics uh, Sweden consumes at the moment. Here's how much we would consume in 2040 if we follow the general projections of 3 to 4% per year increase. Here's how much we actually recycle. So it's, not, it's way lower than the 40 plus percent that, that got get reported because this is what's left after we lose stuff in the recycling process. Here's how much we, uh, we think we can recycle by 2040. So that's a four-fold increase in, uh, in recycling rate, or kind of an eight to nine-fold increase in actual recycling volume, which everybody understands is a massive undertaking for society, for consumers, for regulators. And still, we have more plastic waste in the end. So this is just one snapshot, one example the numbers would have of course changed if the growth was instead of 3.5%, it was 3%. But you know, by and large, this, this picture will look more or less the same in any country in Europe or in Europe at aggregate level. And the elephant in the room here is, of course, this pillar here. So what, what do we do <laughs> if, if this is what the situation will look like in 2040? I'm not saying this to deride plastic producers. I think they, they have an extremely important role to play but producing, the concept of producing needs to change. So then, if you look at the circular economy plastics, uh, circular economy for plastic, I would say it entails redesigning the system, first of all, and uh, also pulling on innovations in all different areas. So it's innovations in collection systems, recycling technologies, but also in design and production of plastics, which include a massive um, a massive increase in alternative delivery models that maybe have to inclu in include more uh, reusable plastics as well. Because if you re reuse the plastic, we don't have to go through this extremely complicated and, and expensive pathway of collecting, sorting, recycling, dealing with contaminants, and so on. Seems achievable, right? Fantastic. But then there are the chemicals, which we are actually here to talk about. Um, the linear economy has, has sort of the benefits, or <laughs> what we should say, of, of making chemicals management a little simpler. I mean, 
let's say we put in 10 units here in, in the system, most of it kind of gets, gets wasted. At least we don't keep these chemicals. Maybe we keep a little bit here, but it's very negligible, whatever ent enters back in the system. If we have a circular economy for plastics and we put in the same amount from the beginning, we, we know that most of this will come back. If we, if we recycle most of it, most of it will come back in some way. And if we do this over and over again, well, accumulation. Or at least this is if we don't change anything in how we recycle our plastics or what we put in in the first place. Now, I, I'd say there are three different strategies to deal with this. Um, they're not mutually exclusive, but hopefully more or less collectively exhaustive. One is, of course, to design out uh, those additives or chemicals that we, we really don't think we can, uh, we can deal with at high concentrations, or replace them with something which we can deal with. Another is to remove them here somewhere along the way, and there are technologies to do that. But that, of course, comes with a cost. And a third one is to accept that as in a circular economy, and this is not just for plastics, of course, it's in kind of any kind of cl more, more closed loop material system, we do have higher levels of legacy substances that we just need to accept. We may need to accept we don't know exactly where they are, but in order to do that, we need, we need to be at least sure that whatever we put in there was safe to begin with. And that we are safe with their concentrations being maybe more elevated than we actually need for uh, when we put them in in the first place. And this has pretty significant uh, implications for, for the regulatory framework. Uh, I'd like to say without being any, anything near an expert on, uh, on policy on chemicals. And I think this is really the crux and of the in the and the intersect of the conversation that we that we heard about when it, when we talk about circular economy on the one hand and chemical safety on the other. This keeps me awake at night. I'm I, I'm not standing here to say that oh this is easy. This is probably the, one of the hardest questions to solve if we want to move to a circular economy, which we have already agreed we have to do because of 60 years of topsoil left, because of depletion of finite resources and all the rest. So we need to address this. At least the conversation has started, I would say, but it's very, very primitive. Um, Jane and others have contributed to a, a report from the EU called The Circular Economy of Plastics, where there is a huge, the biggest chapter, I think, uh, very well researched on how to deal with chemicals. And I recommend everyone to read it if you haven't already. There was a, a conference with more than 200 attendees uh, on chemicals policy in the EU in Brussels in June where some time was dedicated to talk about circular economy and plastics. So great that it happened. Um, uh, my own reflection from having been there is that was that that conversation was particularly unstructured and uh, very heated. So the temperature need to, needs to go down and uh, uh, this time spent together actually looking at objective uh, pragmatic solutions need to go up. Some output has come also from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation together with its partners here, Google and, and, and the EMF published a paper, uh, a white paper you could say, um, a year ago or so. Uh, this is a paper on how to deal with tracking chemicals, um, especially when you wanted to try to recycle them uh, in a way where you don't actually have a physical chain of custody. So uh, it's a paper uh, about the mass balance approach and how to use that for, for recycling in, for example, plastics. And I would like to finish by just by just saying that you know this all feels quite overwhelming, but at least momentum has never been higher. So there are good news and there are bad news, but the momentum has never been higher. One uh, one prominent example of this is the New Plastics Economy Global Commitment. So this is uh, basically a protocol for for moving towards a, a, a circular economy for plastics. There are a couple of things here that. I would say are first in the world, at least in, in, in the plastic space, and that are very significant. One is that there is now one common vision that 400 organizations have signed, which means that you know, there is a common vision. There never was a common vision before for what, what we want the plastic system to be. This vision uh, contains um, uh, a bullet for eliminating problematic and unnecessary plastic items 
So this is something 400 plus organizations have signed on to, 160 plus businesses have made quantitative commitments around. It also talks about the importance of uh, establishing more reuse models, making sure that all the plastics are either recyclable, reusable, or compostable when put to market, making sure that we not only uh, we're not only satisfied with the recyclability in principle, but also that things do get reused, recycled, or composted in practice, which is, of course, what matters. Decoupling plastics use, virgin plastics use, from, from fossil fuels uh, extraction over time. And that finally, all plastic packaging is free of hazardous chemicals, and that the health, safety, and integrity of the people working and being exposed to plastics are, are respected. So apart from signing on to this vision, the, the 160 companies that make quantitative commitments report on these commitments on an annual basis, starting this year. Um, and the commitments are to 2025, so they're not some sort of waffly, vague things far into the future, which people will forget about. They're designed to actually set us on a pathway that can take us to circularity. And to take some examples of what, what brands have, have done um, as a as a consequence of making these commitments. For example, Unilever, Coca-Cola, and, and a number of brands on the Loop platform, including P&G, Nestle, and so on, have all started working on reuse models for their normal consumer goods. That was unthinkable three and a half years ago. Completely unthinkable. We have uh, a number of more and more publicly communicated strategies around circular economy. I'm just taking a couple of examples here. Uh, a month and a half or so ago, Google released its circular economy strategy. Nestle has made a lot of noise about the 80% um, the or so strong, strong research institute that they have established to really work on sustainable packaging solutions. And down here, um, uh, P&G has, as one of the first FMCG companies, announced that they will also work to reduce their absolute level of virgin input into packaging by, of course, working on uh, increasing recycled content and working on reuse models. So that's it from my side. I hope I stuck somewhat to time. <laughs>